everybody, I am Nikki Novak from Fandango and I am so excited to be sitting down with the cast of Avatar The Way of Water. Great to see you all. And the original cast of Avatar, before we get started into this film, I want to take a little trip down memory lane. This film, it was a seminal film, this film. I know when I saw it for the first time, it changed what I thought cinema could be and how I could experience movies. You were there, but now you've had some distance from it. What was either a moment that sort of defined that experience for you? And sort of, what do you take away from it now all these years later? As an actor, when you get down into what we call the volume, you're basically in your you know, your capture suit, and there's nothing around you. There's no world of Pandora. There's only the other actors in their little black suits. And there was a screen that Jim Cameron put up for us where you could see a roughed out version of yourself as what you would look like in the finished product in the, in the world of the film. And even that, I must say, the first day looking at that magical transformation just from us standing there I thought wow uh, I can't believe where this is going it's going to be such a complete immersion of the audience into this foreign beautiful world Absolutely. and I think it it really does that for people Absolutely, a special moment <sighs> I'm pretty sure that all of us can relate uh, was getting that phone call from Jim saying, you, you got the part, I really want you to play, you know, uh, w whichever respective roles we were going, we, we ended up playing. Nateria. <laughs> Nateria, I want you to play. <laughs> for me, Jake you Sully, yes, yeah, nice to meet you, nice to meet you. I thought you forgot who you were playing. I totally did. No, but, but the very first scene that we were able to capture uh, was the scene where Neytiri is uh, is kind of like spying on Jake Sully as he's lost and he's he's you know he's left behind by his by his group and um, and I remember the very first take that we did it was the the moment that everything kind of synced together and fell into place the, from the training to to the the language to everything that all the endless conversations with Jim it all culminated in that one moment and i remember feeling at that very moment like this is going to be really special this is very exciting wow it was a good meet cute i remember <laughs> when i uh, read the script originally it was a bit like reading a novel uh, Jim writes in an extreme, extremely uh, and densely uh, descriptive way. So it's very novelistic. And then the moment I would get to is when I saw the film, when I saw the finished film. And it just, the first thing that came to me was he had realized completely what I had read on the page. And that's a very, very rare thing to, to do, it seems to me. And it, it pretty, it blew my mind. I've never, uh, yeah, never quite forgotten that, you know, it translated absolutely. Wow. Yeah. So stepping onto set all these years later, does it feel like a completely different thing or did it feel familiar sort of stepping back into the shoes? Because the technology's change, you're immersed in, in water for a lot of the film and then coming back to this family, what was that feeling like? That's a big question. <laughs> <laughs> Look, Avatar is like a dream to me. It was a dream to get the job, but the, the movie was like a dream, and so we've been able to play in this other new world. But it's just like a continuation of the dream. And now we're lucky enough to get to share it. And hopefully all those feelings that people felt in the first one come flooding back and then some. Speak, I can't wait to see it. I think everybody is so excited. I know, Zoe, I don't know how much of the film that you've all seen. I think, Zoe, you've talked about you've seen the first 10 minutes, or James showed you the first 10 minutes, and that you wept. Yeah. And I'm wondering, and if it sort of maybe speaks to Sigourney, what you were also talking about, the first time you sort of saw yourself next to what Pandora would look like. How blown away? Are audiences even ready for what they're going to no. see in this film? Do no. they have any idea, or do you think it's going to be the same thing as like the first time where we're like, how um, did somebody do this? you know this? what? I, I do believe and my hope is that it'll be the same, we'll have the same reaction that we had for Avatar 1 and that will be more than okay because that was groundbreaking already as it was so a continuation of this it is almost as if it's a rediscovery of Pandora because before we got to see Pandora through the forest and through the eyes of the Omotikaya tribe and now we're stepping into the world of the Metkaina you know not V and they are 
the the water people. It is the water world, and I I do believe that Pandora is very similar to Earth, where in the sense that 80% of that planet is water. It's a world all on its own, and it's absolutely beautiful. And I do believe that this is going to be a like a culmination. Of, of Jim finally getting the opportunity to fully share with us all mm -hmm. his passion for the water, for the ocean. Yeah. He's always had it. He, he had it in the abyss and with Titanic. And in um, life, he went down. In to real life, with all of his excursions, yeah, uh, the documentaries. Megalodon, I think he went down. Yeah. Yeah, I think whatever he saw down there, he, he brought back. He brought back. <laughs> and, and, um, and I think that through the Mikaina tribe and, and their world, we're going to immerse ourselves in something that we have never seen before. And it will be also uh, just as groundbreaking as Avatar 1 was. Well, I actually want to use a pun, dive a little bit deeper into the underwater world of Pandora. What are we actually going to see? What kind of creatures can we expect to see? I know James has talked a little bit about when he goes down to the bottom of the ocean, it's almost like being on another planet. Um, can you talk maybe, Sigourney, about that? What are we going to experience visually? Well, we, we were able to see 13 minutes at uh, D23, and I would say a lot of that was underwater. It was so real and seemed to fill the entire theater that I actually felt my feet moving as if I had to tread water just to stay uh, as part of it. I think it's even more mind-blowing than the first one because it's just such a new element for us as human beings to feel comfortable underwater and um, to, to, to feel a connection with the, the creatures that, that live underwater. It's very much, I think, what Jim would dream of if he could, if he could create any experience for us to, to, to give us the ability to be underwater without needing to breathe. And he's given it to us here and in such a breathtaking way. People will never want to leave the theater, honestly. They'll just want to sit there and see it again and again because it's, it's something you can't get in real life. Wow. You know? Stephen, maybe you can speak a little bit, too. Um, and I know James isn't here to talk about the sort of the technical aspect of it, but little things like the frames per second that normally in a film it's like 26, in this film it's sped up. So sort of give people that real immersive feel that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about sort of how you work as an actor when you're when it's probably the most ambitious movie ever made? How does that change for you, your performance as an actor? Does it make it more complicated for you? I think that it's probably the more sophisticated or, or, or complicated the technology, probably the, the, the wise thing to do is to simplify, simplify, simplify as an actor. Keep it simple, stupid. That's my, <laughs> my motto when I get in there. But, but, but truthfully, I mean, the, uh, uh, the environment that's always been created for us, and actually we're all sitting where we are right now is stage 27 here, where, and we did the bulk of our work in this yeah. very room oh, here. Oh, did you really? Yeah, in it fact, feels like yeah. home, yeah. yeah. Over there. I believe that right where we are right now, Sam and I probably fought it out with a chain in our hand at some point, yeah. as I recall. But, it, but, but um, the, uh, the atmosphere, the conditions that were always created for us were always, I think, as beneficial to the actors they, as they could possibly be. I mean, uh, what we do as actors is such a peculiar thing in the first place, we pretend for a living, that any circumstances are weird, it seems to me, you know? And I'm not sure that, that, that you know, the volume is any stranger than any other circumstance. In fact, because of the nature of the room itself, which is actually kind of a bare bones situation, it really calls upon you to just exercise your, mm. the powers of your own imagination to create, 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 wow. it seems to me. So I don't know if that answers it the does. question, but it's what I wanted to say. Well, aside from being <laughs> in this incredible soundstage that now I feel like I'm a part of history here, you did a lot of free diving. There was a lot called upon all of you as actors to do something you've never done before and using a technology, and that's filming underwater with these performance capture suits. We, we were the guinea pigs. Yeah. You were the guinea I pigs. I thought we were going to get zapped because you got all your power packs on. Oh and Jim's saying get in the water, it's never been done before. So I thought we were going to get fried. I'm like, okay, sir. So I understand that Kate Winslet <laughs> broke the record. She yeah. beat Tom right. Cruise's record for the number of minutes filming a scene underwater. She did seven minutes. I want to know how you all did. R.I.P. Kate. 
<laughs> That's why she's not here today. <laughs> but how, how, what do you experience? Where did you sort of begin in your ability to hold your breath? I think it was about a year of training. Where did you end up? And what does it actually feel like performing underwater? And how do you emote underwater? How do you act well, underwater? Well, we worked, we worked with a world-renowned uh, uh, expert, Kirk. Mm -hmm. For months. For I mean, months. We studied for a, about a year. We wow. started, you know, just getting certified for scuba. And uh, I remember even the first day, he, he has you be very still with your face in the water and we were able to hold our breath for a minute, yeah. which surprised me. And then he continued to build on that, do, doing breathing up exercises. And you also have the benefit of enhanced oxygen when you're actually shooting the movie so that... Yeah. Um, you're breathing up on 80% oxygen. Yeah. Real life is only, say, 24%. Or at least 50%. Yeah, so your, the amount that your, of oxygen your blood cells are taking allows you to be under there longer. But it's yeah. all about calm and meditative, Staying, which, yeah. you know, Sigourney's a half fish. It's, yeah. it's incredible. Yeah. But hardly. Hardly. Yeah. You hardly. It's amazing. You My husband is half yeah. fish, and I want it to be half fish, but <laughs> I'm, a, I'm maybe yeah. a quarter fish now. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> so to, uh, to, to ask uh, the question about how do you, how difficult is it to act underwater, to emote? To do, um, it was never an easy thing, at least for me. Um, but having the tools and going through all the breathing exercises and knowing that I was surrounded by uh, people that at any given second were going to do whatever they can mm -hmm. to make sure that I was safe, it does put you in a meditative sort of you know, place where you surrender. <laughs> I think that surrendering was, was the key factor that my body needed in order for me to be able to be relaxed down there. And by, by surrendering, I was able to always practice all the tools um, because it wasn't just that we were under the water. We were also going, you know, 20, 25, up to 30 feet Right? Was it yep, ever? Yep, 30 feet is the tank. 30 yeah. feet was the maximum. The tank is 30 feet deep. And when you're doing that, like every five to eight feet, you're, you're equalizing. So you're making, because as your, your lungs are, are feeling, you know, the pressure of the depth, you have to equalize to make sure that you're fine. So that by the time you get there and they do the count and they say action, you know you're going to give Jim at least 45 seconds to a minute and a half of good performance. So and your brain I needed to break out. it all down. Your, your brain's wigging out all because the you time. can't just race to the surface when you're 30 feet deep. Because your body would just explode. So no yeah, pressure. it's all about a lot of no pressure. pressure. No, a lot of pressure. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's all pressure. Yeah. But, uh, but you have to be calm. And I think yeah. that, it, it was, for me, it was the toughest thing I've ever had to do. And then to be down there and know that if you're doing an action scene underwater, you're going to be burning your energy at a quicker rate. Mm -hmm. So you're going to run out of whatever oxygen your body has left. And then to do an emotional scene and your brain's talking to you too much and you're wigging out and you don't want to look like a blowfish, you're trying to be calm and just connect with your fellow actor who's gone through the same process down there. So it, it was, to be honest, that's the and toughest thing I've ever had to do in my life. And it all starts yeah. with the static hold, yeah. which is, the, as Sigourney said, it was the first thing you did. And when you do the static hold, you're just immersing your face in the water and everything is supported. You don't have to spend any energy keeping yeah. your arms up or anything like that. It's a savasana, in a, in a sense. And it's something you can you can return to time and time again. And, and interestingly enough, it's kind of the one thing from the water that I think I've taken away from mm -hmm. me also wow. is that yes. I think static hold quite a lot oh. in my, on an airplane oh sometimes. I kind of call it static hold now. I'm on static hold. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a good lesson for life if we're ever in the water. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I want to talk about your characters. Some of you are playing new characters, some of you are returning <laughs> to characters. I want to start with you, Sigourney, because Kiri, I'm fascinated by her, because I understand that Jim came to you and said, I want you to play a teen girl. You're perfect for the role. What does he know <laughs> about you that we don't? That's a and, good question. And, I'm a little worried about that myself. From, from um, what I understand, you went to, you had like a workshop with teens, you did parkour. Can you talk about sort of yeah. getting into character for this one? Well, I do know Jim pretty well, and he has, you know, known him over the years, and he knows that I'm basically a silly person, even though I may seem serious. 
And so, uh, and I think he is too. I mean, that's the big surprise about Jim because you think, oh, he's so intimidating and scary and serious. But he's actually, you know, he's a, a pussycat and he's very, very funny. <laughs> so, you know, we can be quite immature together. And I think he just, I was very touched that he would think that, um, that I could play this part. I had an immediate connection with her because I remember that time in my life when I, when I was that age. But I also think that she is at that age where she feels much happier to be in the forest with, with the plants and everything. She feels much more comfortable there than with, in society with people where she, she doesn't feel secure. And um, I just think I had to... Luckily, we had, a, we had a, quite a bit of time because we kept postponing, but I was able to kind of go back and really um, immerse myself in what it felt like to be that age. I did go and check out um, some classes at uh, a high school because I wanted to um, hear the range of voices, you know, the pitch of voices. And 14 is very interesting because you have such a range of, uh, you know, people from, you know, they still seem very childlike with, with high voices to, you know, the same age. A um, person could be, you know, very mature looking and sounding. So it kind of made me feel like I could just follow Kiri's lead and come up with whatever it w was right for her. Does Kiri have a connection to Dr. Grace Augustine at all? Is there any sort of, like, was there any sort of transference? Or I don't know if that's a spoiler point or a plot point. Or is there a connection at all? There is a connection. Okay. And you have to go see the movie to know exactly what it is. But there is a very strong connection. Where is this relationship? We left off happily ever after. They're now married. They're now together. They have family together. Are they still having date night? Are they still? Yeah, they're, 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 they're actually, they actually are. Are they? We did a scene where they were having. They date should night. not yeah. be having they, because they, they have so busy. many kids. Got, yeah. <laughs> so how have these characters evolved since the last film? Well, it's the ultimate love story. Mm -hmm. You know, they're in two different worlds, and they found each other, and the the, the natural progression as you always say, was to go forward with a family. And it's a family that they've made and created and that, that they've chosen as well. And, you know, and, and that's, to me, that was the, the heart of the story, is this protection of this family, the protection of this love, which is very important when it's under stress. You know, Jake's split again. Is he going to protect his family on one side or is he going to step up and protect the Navi? On the other side, where does his responsibilities lie? And so that was the, that's his dilemma in this movie. Yeah, and, I, and their relationship is definitely one for the books. They are partners. They are um, in love, uh, trying to, you know, have a life together in a time of war as well. As you can see from the footage that was just shared, you know, war just keeps knocking at their door. And they have no choice now but to protect their children but by protecting them are they preparing them also you know that's that so they're they are going to be challenged as a family in terms of what what the idea of of love and battle um is and um and they're going through normal parental stuff too absolutely. your kids are talking back to them they're talking oh. back they're disobeying yeah, they're, they're going exactly where they're being like. told not to go <laughs> naughty little they're monkeys getting man. in trouble yeah. um and, and yeah, they're also, petulant, they're yeah, boisterous, they're, they're what so the kids are, and, you know, and, and, so, yeah. and so they're going through the struggles that every parent goes through, as you said, in a time of extreme stress and battle of a planet. Yeah, and yeah. Naitiri once again has to, you know, find it in her heart to, to, to accept or forgive or, or work with these these invaders that are never going to go away. It's like a fungus. It's like, it doesn't matter where you stop it. It's going to keep growing from someplace else. And and I I do believe that her her challenges will be to to still make room just to, just the way Awa has taught her to still make room for for that kind of you know compassion that she really just doesn't naturally have for these humans. He took two arrows to the chest mm. in the last film. He's mm. back. He's I back know. as an Talk avatar. about fungus. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it, but I thought that when you said it. You, you've mentioned that this character spent some time in hell, and now he's back. <laughs> he's regrouped. He's in regrouped, hell. and now he's back. Uh, yeah. um, you play. You have. You play the form of an avatar this time. So this changed 
your performance, I'm sure, as well. Is he more evil than ever? What is he, what is oh, he dealing boy. with this time? I, I would never use the word evil myself, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> misunderstood, okay. that's how we would. No, I wouldn't use the word misunderstood either. What I would say is that whatever, that, that Quaritch is born and reborn under the same aggressively wayward star. Uh, that Quaritch is um, his world, his DNA, his, 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 his ethos, everything about him is destined for combat, for aggression. It's, I don't know what to say other than that, that, that it's almost a physical trait for him. He can do no more, he can do no less than that. His name, Quaritch, rhymes with war, he's got an itch for war, it's quarrel, it's everything about it is, he's, um, yeah. And that has not changed. That he's brought that fundamental corichness to him in his new incarnation. But what has changed is that this new incarnation is, is Pandora. And all of that is Im implied. It's Ewa. It's the, uh, the life and fluid nature of water. Uh, I've always felt that, 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 that Pandora represented kind of fluid and movement and, and curves, whereas Quaritch was always meant to be right angles. Mm. He always moved it. He thinks in right angles. He moves in right angles. But that is, now his conflict is that, yeah, that's all there, but there's this other stuff coming in there yeah. too, which is, for, I, maybe it's Awa. I don't know what it is. So, so I want to ask about the 3D. James sort of redefines 3D. How is this, how is sort of the technology evolved in the sense of like, how much different is it going to look from the first one? How much more, how, is this the only way for audiences to experience this film is in 3D in your opinion? No, no, his look story is always Jim's main viewpoint. He loves technology advancements, obviously. And with 3D, he's always looked at it as an immersive quality. I think when you're doing a story that a lot of it is set underwater, that immersive quality is really going to take an audience from their seat into, as you said, treading water, you know, having to you feel like you might have to hold your breath. I think he's, he's using the skills and tools and that he's, you know, worked on for years and has discovered and has actually made the cameras for to take that audience out of their seat and into Pandora. And that was always what he wanted to do. But you're only going to stay in Pandora if the storyline is strong and the characters are empathetic. So. But I think you will have to, you know, you have to experience this in the theater. And the, I think one of the reasons it, it took a long time was that he was actually waiting mm. for the technology to catch okay. up to yeah. his vision. So as breathtaking as the first experience was and as visceral, I think this is even more ambitious and even more remarkable. Um, and it, it sets 3D you know, into a whole new realm. It really took my breath away to watch it yesterday. Mm -hmm. Just the 13 minutes we saw, I thought, oh my God, what a glorious return to the theaters yeah. we will have because you can only have this excitement, joy, and everything else when you are in the theater watching it in 3D. And as we wrap up, what, what do you hope audiences are going to feel or what do, you, what do you think the reaction is going to be when they see this? And then we always want more. Can you tease a little bit for the following Avatar and will we see you in four and are we potentially thinking of five? None of us are allowed to answer that question. <laughs> as best as you can. These arrows will come out of the darkness. <laughs> you know, we'll get two to the chest, um, like you said. <laughs> No, obviously the, the, the wish is always for more. This is something that we have enjoyed making. We, have, we feel humbled to be a part of, uh, but we also enjoy watching and witnessing um, with audiences. So um, three is going to be a continuation of two. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I hope that this makes sense. I know that this is as much as I have to say, but and what two will have is an experience that will be unforgettable, lingering, <laughs> in, in, in other words. Uh, it will be groundbreaking. It will be gut-wrenching. It would be beautiful. It will be, you know, uh, it, it'll just be really profound. And if, if two 
is able to captivate you in the way that one did, then then just please wait for three because it's so much better too. <laughs> and you know, as, as much as we may talk about the technology, and I frankly can't begin to describe how it's changed. Ever, ever. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be just like any other uh, spectator when I, when I see it, um, just in awe. But I think the story that starts after one, starts with two, builds to three, and then four, and then five, is so involving. Mm -hmm. And when you come out of the theater, yes, you will have had an amazing physical experience, transformative, but what you will be thinking about is the characters Absolutely. you spend time with, their, their situation, and their bonds with each other, as well as this new world you get to see. I think it's so much about the story, always with Jim. That's what you take out with you. Yeah, I think he spent four years writing the scripts, from what I heard. I mean, that's a huge undertaking. I hope we will see the line, I see you, make a comeback, perhaps. Yeah. Yes, yep. it's coming back. Anything new, any new catchphrases we should look out for? No. I'm sure, but you'll also have your, you know, your I famous you. old your, one. Your, I see you mean so your much. Your scowns and yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So I see you means everything. It, it yeah. doesn't just mean that I see you. It means I love you. It means hello. It means a <laughs> number of like things. Shalom. Yeah. 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 yeah, shalom. Aloha. <laughs> Aloha. Yeah. Yeah. And that was the way the, the first film sort of opened and closed with was, was on your eyes and, yeah. and being seen. Very last question. What do you think the theme of this film is going to be if the last film was sort of you know, finding your way in the world and finding who you are and what your place is. What is the theme of this one? Protecting that. Yeah. I think in the end, it's, for me, it's always love. Yeah. It's always love. Family, it's you know, family. it's a complex group of people and their love for each other, their, their disagreements, all these things. I feel like Jim has a, a family that means so much to him. So much of what's on the page and so much of what we brought to it is a reflection of his love for his family and his enjoyment of their particular qualities, <laughs> characters, you know. He was always talking about, you know, he really wanted us kids to be, to, to reflect what he saw at home. And so we kind of just went at it, you know, <laughs> like the brats we were meant to be.